and I really liked it. That was, that was a voice crack. All in, I'm glad I finally picked it up. I shouldn't say finally. And it was one of those books where, so this came out here this year, 2020, one. <laughs> Hi everybody, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse and welcome to part one of what I read in December. So it's not that I'm reading like a ton ton of books but I figured I would split this up into two parts because I probably have a whole lot, totally have a whole lot to say about the books that I'm reading. But I'm happy to say that I am having a very good reading month. I've been reading kind of a little all over the place. I tend to, with the mood reading, I don't know what it is about the end of the year but I found this last year too and I hesitate to say it's a pattern, but I find myself gravitating to like all sorts of different places. So some of it is like, oh my goodness, I totally wanted to read this book this year, I must get to it. And some of it is like, let me get some short audiobooks that I can gobble up. And you're gonna see all of that reflected in what I talk about today. So let's just get to the books. So if you guys follow me on Instagram, you are already gonna know every feeling I think I had about this book so far, and I'm not done screaming about it. And it is Dave Grohl, the storyteller. I am so obsessed with this book. I don't know, like, I thought I was going to enjoy it going in. When I heard he was writing a book, I was super excited about it. I definitely was a Nirvana fan, a huge Foo Fighters fan. I, I find like from, whether it's like writing or not, but like I'm so fascinated with songwriters and musicians and how they tell their stories and how they relay everything through their words. And I don't, probably getting like way too deep for <laughs> this early in a video. But anyway, I was super excited for this book and I didn't buy it right away because I wanted to listen to the audiobook of it because I very much felt like this is gonna be great hearing Dave Grohl narrate it and after doing all these celeb memoirs this year, I definitely enjoy, and I'm thinking about like the Lenny Kravitz one in particular, literally hearing the story in their own voice. So I signed myself up for a massive wait list at my library and for whatever reason, not mad about it, the weekend of Thanksgiving, the book came to me. And no joke, there was like a six month wait list for this book, so I don't know what happened. <laughs> Either people gobbled through it or were entirely too busy and just kicked it. So I grabbed it, started listening to it, the first day I was listening to it, maybe, I don't even know, 20 minutes into this book, I was like, I need to immediately go buy this and I'm completely obsessed. This book not only is a history of him with Nirvana and with Foo Fighters, which is all very interesting to me, but it is how he got into music. It's the beginning of his life. It's his family. It's his friends. It is his entire evolution to where he is today. And it's one of these books where I feel like he has so many stories to tell. I don't even know how he chose what to put in here. But what really struck me were the, like, the pearls of wisdom that I didn't expect to get from him and the emotion I wasn't expecting. I cried during this book. Hearing him talk about his friends and his family and his wife and his children and his relationships throughout the business and then how he was turned on to punk music in the first place and his love for drumming and how he taught himself how to be a drummer and just sort of interwoven with these super cool like hanging out with Paul McCartney at dinner and all of these people that he knows and everyone who influenced him I like I don't even have the words I did not dog ear this but you guys if I could have dog eared this book I would have but I don't dare dog ear this book but there's just so many beautiful lines and words which shouldn't surprise me because he is a storyteller and his lyrics are everything to me so anyway long story short i had decided i was going to buy it and this was during NaNoWriMo so it was thanksgiving weekend and i made a deal with myself because i had past 50,000 words which was the goal for nano and I was just completely obsessing. So I wound up going to my local Barnes and Noble. I needed to do some holiday shopping. I knew they had some signed editions of this and I decided if they had a signed edition in the store, I would buy it as my treat to myself. This was the last one in the stack of signed books. Ah. 
And I know it like doesn't mean anything because I didn't meet him, but at the same time, I just think it's pretty cool. But there were a ton of the books, but only one left of the signed one. So I bought it, so happy about it. And I also mentioned this, I feel like when I did a haul, I don't know what it is about this book. Like, I think it's the paper it's written on. It's so physically heavy compared to like a different book. I, I don't know how to describe it. If anybody has this book, tell me if you notice that. And then I love that there's like a little him and then on the back it says turn it up listen with me so it's just it's such a good book there's pictures in here as well sort of like sprinkled with that or um throughout and i thought it was great i absolutely thought it was great i feel like he has so many more stories to tell i hope because of the success of this book that he will write more and i'm just fascinated so i listen to the foo fighters pretty regularly i've had them on overdrive a few of their songs so i kind of go both ways like two different ways when i'm writing so there's music i will literally listen to while i'm physically writing and right now this year i have found the soundtrack to defending jacob that apple tv show that soundtrack is everything. I was listening to different music before, and as soon as I went to that one, and I don't even remember how I sort of explored that or found it on Apple TV, I think because I was listening to movie TV show soundtracks, and it came up as a suggestion, perfectly puts me in the zone. Every day when I write, headphones in, that soundtrack comes on. But on the flip side, there are songs that inspire either my characters or a story I wanna tell, or there's a line that gives me an idea, or it just sort of like encapsulates a certain moment in the book and several fighter songs do that, but No Way Back is the one that I think of constantly and it's always in my head and every time I hear it, I just get like fired up for my book. So anyway, <laughs> you hear about Dave Grohl, not me. This book is amazing. Highly recommend it to anyone who is a fan of rock biographies, whether or not you're a fan of Nirvana and Foo Fighters, um, any kind of celeb bio, memoir, it's just, it's great. It's, it's everything. So the next book I read was also an audio book and it was Comfort Me With Apples by Catherine M. Valenti. And then the audio narrator of this was, I wanna say it's Carice, K-A-R-I-S, Campbell, Carice Campbell. So this is a novella. It was pitched as a horror book. This was definitely on my anticipated list. This was one of those books that when I did my book reviewers spoil books video. This was one of those books that got spoiled for me. So I did put off reading it a little bit, but when I saw the audiobook was available, I was like, let me not punish the book for something somebody else did <laughs> and give it a go. So this was like a two and a half hour book. I, I have a hard time separating my feelings about this book because I knew something I did not want to know going in. So I don't wholly know how I would have felt if I didn't know this part of it, but overall I enjoyed it. So I would say like atmospheric, well-written, like the writing itself I very much enjoyed. There were just sort of like unsettling feelings to it. So again, it's like pitched as horror, but I think I need to just change this mindset because I found this come up several times. When I think of horror, I mistakenly think of horror films and I immediately think slasher, bloody, gory, violent. And I know that that is so naive and so not right and that there are so many versions of horror and there could be like body horror books, but there is also unsettling horror and ghosty horror and the horror of humans and the horror of what people will do. And I do like books that dance the line. And we're going to talk about another book next that dances the line. So I heard it was horror. I sort of went in with one expectation, especially knowing what I knew. Spoiler. But like, I'm not going to spoil it for you guys, but the person who spoiled it for me. <laughs> but anyway, I would say it is worth the read. I would go in blind as possible. This is one of those books where I feel like the little synopsis of it gives you just enough of a taste to know if it's something you might want to read, but doesn't give away too much. And this one is about a woman named Sophie. She is happily married in the perfect marriage. 
So her and her husband live in a place called Arcadia Gardens. And it's this idyllic housing complex. And when I say like their board has some rules, like remember the rules in Lock Every Door by Riley Sager, where it was like you can't have friends over and you have to spend every night at the Bartholomew? That place looks so low maintenance compared to Arcadia Gardens because they have rules like you wouldn't believe. But it's perfect. Her life is perfect, her marriage is perfect, her husband is perfect, everything is perfect. And of course, Sophie starts to feel like something's not quite perfect. And her husband, he's gone a lot and he goes on a lot of business trips and he comes home and he doesn't really want to talk about stuff. And he is building this house for her and there's parts of it that aren't done yet and there's rooms she's not allowed to go into, but curiosity sort of gets the better of her and she starts to snoop. And it becomes that like, is it too good to be true? Like if it looks too good to be true, if it looks too perfect, there's probably something there. So, and it becomes one of these things where, like if it seems like it's perfect, something probably is a little bit off. So I very much enjoyed it. I did not know the direction it was going in. Like I, I knew the direction it was going in because of the thing, which I'll stop harping on, but then I didn't wholly know where it was gonna go at the end. And I really liked it. And I will definitely read more things by Catherine Valenti. And it just was sort of like that good, ominous, well-written, I feel like unsettling is just sort of the word for it is how I felt, but all in, I'm glad I picked it up. And I would recommend it if you're just looking for a fast, like I said, kind of atmospheric, kind of ominous read. The next book I picked up, which also does a pitch perfect job of dancing a line, is The Lost Village by Camilla Sten. And I have had this book for a bit and was going to kind of like felt like it should be an october -y kind of book, but you know, the mood, the mood, the mood. So I'm so happy I picked this up. And this is, it was kind of pitched as like Blair Witchy, which full disclosure, I never saw Blair Witch. So I know about it, I know of it. I don't, like I kind of know part of the story, but I've never actually seen it. But if I can find it, uh, my friends and I one year were Blair Witch <laughs> for Christmas, or for Christmas, for Halloween. If I can find the picture, I'll pop it in. Best Halloween costume ever, by the way, because you can wear jeans and flannels and it's October and it's cold, so who doesn't want to do that? But back to the book. So this book was translated by Alexandra Fleming. This was translated from Swedish. So this came out in the US in 2021 and it came out in Sweden in 2019, I want to say, and I am correct. So this book is told in dual timelines. And in 1959, in this small mining town in Sweden, the entire village disappeared. Almost 900 people, the lost village is what it becomes dubbed, basically disappeared into thin air. So the police eventually make their way to this town because sort of word gets out that something's wrong and they find a woman hanging in the town square, having been stoned to death. And then they find an abandoned newborn baby, which they rescue. And no one has ever figured out what has happened to this town. It was literally like people walked out their front door, coffee cups were still on the table. It was like everyone just got up, walked out the door and disappeared. So then we fast forward to present day and our main character, Alice, she is a documentary filmmaker and she wants to make the documentary of what happened to the Lost Village. So she recruits a couple friends and she decides that she is going to make this kind of like teaser video because she's trying to like raise money and be able to afford the full documentary, be able to pay for the full documentary. So they are sort of there on an exploratory mission. So this is just the five of them driving out to this abandoned place. They're gonna do some footage, they're gonna look into things, they're gonna try and investigate a bit, and then they're gonna bring it to investors so that they can get some money to make this documentary. So no sooner did they show up there is like weird stuff starts to happen. And we go, present day with Alice and then in 1959 we follow a woman named Elsa and it is very much one of those I will always refer to Riley Sager is it or isn't it dancing the line is it ghosty is it horror is it thrillery is it real people being awful is it things we cannot explain being awful and it's so atmospheric 
it's definitely one of those books where like the tension just keeps creeping and creeping and creeping and everything keeps escalating and it's page churny and I needed to know what was going to happen next and I had all sorts of theories about things of course and I thought it was super well done. I loved the writing of this. I was totally hooked and I loved the ending, fully satisfied with the, the story. It was one of those books where like people are somewhat unlikable, people are somewhat messy, people feel very real, and there's elements of relatability to it. And I always, I always read author's notes. So whether it's a forward to the book, whether it's sort of an aftermath to the book, I always read the acknowledgements in a book, but there is a really interesting forward in this book from Camilla Sten, which I would highly recommend reading. If people don't normally read them, I would, because I feel like the context I feel like a lot of times like a, a forward and afterward put the book in a whole different context. But one thing which I think is very well done and which she says she didn't necessarily intentionally set out to do is there is a huge theme of mental health in this and the perception of it and the perception of mental illness in history, how it was viewed back then, how it's viewed today, how people struggle with it, how people cope with it, how people manage it. and. You know, she said she just sort of like set out to write a book that was going to be fun for her to write. And it just, and I love this writer head on, how stories just take different directions sometimes. And stories go places you didn't even intend them to or you weren't even cognizant of at the time. But i had really, really interested in her as a writer. So I'm super excited. I actually have the arc of her next book, The Resting Place, which is not a series, standalones. That comes out in March, so I'm really, really excited for that. And I'm a new fan. I am I'm a fan of her writing. I thought this was just great. And again, like well-written, well-crafted. I was hooked by the story. I was hooked by the characters. And it was like, it was a, I would say it was like a pleasant surprise in some ways, because I wasn't sure. Like I thought I would like it. I didn't expect to love it as much as I did. So chalk this up to another one of the books that I didn't see coming this year and loved it. Next up is another audiobook I listened to, and this one is Reflections on the Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. So I have read the art part of the Artist's Way. I'm not even gonna pretend I read all of it. So backwards in time, I had done a writing class at the BCAE when I lived in Boston. It's Boston Center for Adult Education, back when I lived in Boston. And the teacher of this class was very into not just the writing we were doing, but the writing process, the writing life, the life of a writer. And he introduced me to Julia Cameron and introduced me to her morning pages. So morning pages, this is sort of like the core of what she talks about, is every morning you write three pages. And this is applicable for any kind of creator. So this isn't just for writers, she talks about painters and sculptors and you know any kind of artist musician writer and how this sort of clears your way for helping you to prioritize for helping you to focus for helping you get clarity and you just free write and it's all about writing first thing in the morning where you're not quite awake but you're kind of awake and it definitely is a shift in how you start your day and you're focusing and your priorities and we did it and I didn't always do it in the morning and sometimes I did it at night, but it was definitely really helpful. It took me a while to sort of like get it and it's sort of all those things like, am I doing it right, am I not? But anyway, this is not just about, <laughs> this book wasn't just about that, but that's sort of the core of her message and what a lot of people know her for. So I have been in the mood to write, but I've also been craving different sorts of inspiration and motivation. And when I saw this audiobook, I also was like, must have. So this was another super short one, and it's broken up into a couple of parts. So the first part is an actual lecture, interactive lecture that she's giving. And she speaks on the artist's way, and then she does some Q&A. And then the second part of this is a sit down interview that she does. And she really just talks about the creative life. So I took a whole bunch of, or I, took a whole bunch of notes. I wrote down a whole bunch of quotes on it. So I will sort of like loosely talk about some of the things she talked about, but she talks about everything from how so many people will blame their day job or blame their job for why they can't be creative and 
hate on it and hate their job and let that sort of rule. And what she says is as soon as you start being creative, you might not love your job, but you start to appreciate it because it becomes a means to an end for you. It pays the bills. It affords the things you want to do. It affords you the things you need. It affords you the literal money to pay for things and gives you the time to be creative if you prioritize yourself right. And it is less of a burden to your creativity, but more of something that allows you to be able to have that creativity in your life until you can make hopefully a full shift if that's what you want to do. But she talks about how so many people talk about having to make a dramatic change in order to have room for creativity in their life or have the freedom to have it or the time to have it. And how it's less about making this huge incremental change like quitting your job and more about taking those small steps. So she talks about like with morning pages, don't let it overwhelm you. Don't let it become I can't do it before you've even started. You focus on today. You focus on three pages today and you worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. And you take it in these small incremental steps. And as soon as you start to do sort of all these different little things, and it's about incremental changes, small changes being compounding, being compounding, small changes compounding, kind of like in the Atomic Habits way and taking small risks and the risk could be I'm gonna get up early and write three pages tomorrow. And how those start to fuel you and those start to bring clarity into your life and they start to help you prioritize differently and they help you focus differently. And she talks very much about, you know, the synchronicity of putting in the effort to go after what you want and then the things that you want coming to you. So one of my favorite quotes in this is, she talks about, as you move toward a dream, the dream also moves toward you. It meets you. So it's all about you putting the effort out there for the things that you're passionate about and how your passions come to you. So I just love that and I love that thought process. And she talks a lot about, you know, just getting started. And another quote of hers, which I absolutely love, she said, there's something about being willing to enter the arena. So it's about taking those risks. It's about taking that step. And it's about being brave in some ways to take the risk to do the thing that you say you want to do, that you say you love, that you say you're passionate about and actually doing it. So backing up your words with action and taking those steps, taking those risks. And then there's a big theme about how taking these risks, doing the morning pages, doing the things helps bring clarity and clarity is power is another one of her quotes. So she says, we cause synchronicity by being true to ourselves. So it's being your true self. It's being your true artist that you are on the inside and being that on the outside as well. And I don't even want to admit slash venture to guess how long ago I bought this. This is the artist way morning pages journal. It's literally a journal of blank pages with inspirational quotes on the bottom of it. And there's a Q and A in the back. There's, you know, a little bit of information in the front to get you started, but it is the journal where every day for three pages, you write a contract to yourself that you're going to do it, that you're going to do it. And you are supposed to write. I bought this years ago, you guys, years ago, I think. I don't even know. I don't even know when I bought this. That's how bad it is. That's how bad it is. This was tucked on a shelf with all my writing books. I knew it was there. So one of my many goals for 2022, and I'll be doing a goals video, which I didn't do last year, is I'm going to work on my morning pages and I'm going to recommit and wholly commit to doing the thing that I want to do that I have let get away from me and I have just felt so re-inspired thanks to Nano this year. So I just, I love it. If you are any kind of creative, I highly recommend that, that book. You don't have to buy this to do the morning pages. When I did it the first time, I just did it in a spiral notebook, but I bought this thinking, <laughs> this will make me be more creative. No, but this time it will. And then the next book is Where I Left Her by Amber Garza. So this is, excuse me, I was, feeling after I read The Lost Village, I wanted something a little bit lighter, but still mystery-ish. So this is kind of domestic suspense and it's shorter. And I just kind of wanted something 
not with levity per se, but I was just like in the mood to just sort of like quickly, I keep pulling my own hair, rip through a book. And this is the one I picked up and I quickly ripped through this book. Like this is one of those books that I wanted to keep coming back to every day. I wanted to know what was gonna happen next. It did not take me all that long to read it. And it was really, it was fun and dark and a little twisty. I would say a little suspension of disbelief is required here, but that's fine. And I wasn't sure what was going on. I wasn't sure what was happening. So we get two timelines in this one as well. So this is about a woman named Whitney and she's a single mom. Her ex-husband lives over in Amsterdam and they have a teenage daughter and her daughter is, it's when this book takes place, she's like 15 and then she turns 16. So she is in those years where like she, she's pulling away from her mom. She doesn't want to have anything to do with her. And Whitney, who was the mom, has always felt like it's always been the two of them together. And she's really struggling with her daughter pulling away. So kind of typical teenage rebellion, her daughter Amelia has made some new friends. So kind of all those friends she had when she was younger, friend groups are changing and Whitney's not quite sure sort of what she's getting up to. And she just, again, she's just like a little feeling disconnected from her daughter. So the book opens where she is dropping her daughter off at her new friend Lauren's house for a sleepover. And Whitney knows Lauren, Lauren spent the night at her place too. And the next morning, Whitney goes back to pick her daughter up from the sleepover and this elderly couple answers the door and they're like, um, we don't know who Amelia is. Like your daughter did not spend the night here. I think you're in the wrong place. So this is the first time that Whitney had been to Lauren's house the night before when she dropped her daughter off. So she's like, maybe, maybe I am. It's like a housing development. So she like drives around, drives around, but she swears that Lauren's house had rose bushes in the front of it. And this house is the only one with rose bushes. So she walks back up to the front door and she knocks on it and the same elderly couple opens the door and they're kind of like, we don't know what you're talking about. So this is the spiral that Whitney has. She doesn't know where her daughter is. So we get current timeline of her trying to find her daughter. And then we get the past timeline leading up to her dropping her daughter off. And then we get some like snippets of her history and like her marriage and stuff like that. So this is mother daughter drama. This is some family drama. This was just a fun time. I wasn't sure where it was going. I was enjoying where it went. I just had fun with this. I would put it in the, the popcorn reads kind of category where it wasn't life-changing but it was certainly entertaining to me and i will read more amber garza so i know she has another book i don't know if this one do your research so this is her current book and then she had a book that came out last year called when i was you which i've also heard really good things about which i will definitely give a go to but the cover of this one says one mistake can undo a lifetime of secrets so i very much enjoyed sort of watching Whitney's journey, not only with sort of leading up to where she's feeling the distance with her daughter and like full disclosure, like I was totally like a terrible teen. I feel like I was like, when people talk about like two year olds, like the terrible twos, I definitely was a terrible teen in a lot of ways to my parents. But I also very much enjoyed sort of the after mystery of trying to figure out what happened and like poor Whitney, like losing her mind and just keeps circling back to the same house in the first chapter. And they're like, lady, your kid's not here. So it was a good time. It was definitely a good time. So that's going to do it for the first part of what I read. And I just picked up just picked up i even have it here for you guys the secret she keeps by michael robotham so i am only 40 pages into this one i had had this sort of dog-eared as a book i wanted to read this year i bought a few of his books he has a series i know this is the first one of his that i'm reading but i've heard great things about it stephen king is quoted on the cover and after reading the girls are also nice here, which I just finished, which I will talk about in part two of this. I've definitely been craving that dark female friendship. And I should have said, this actually has good dark female friendship in it too. And it just sort of put me in that mood. So I am gobbling up those books. It's just what I'm feeling right now. And I had plans to read some stuff from my snowy recommendations video, which I haven't done yet, but it's not snowing. 
but it is like 20 nothing degrees here today so we'll see what happens but anyway i'm enjoying this this is dual points of view it's two different women i don't know too much about it yet because i'm so new into it so it just says megan doesn't know agatha but agatha knows megan so i'll leave you guys with that one but let me know what you guys are reading read any of these and i will be back with part two after the end of the month. I'm also working on my year-end content, but I'm waiting till the end of the year. I've said this in other videos too, so apologies for the repeat, but I feel like I never know when a book is going to be a favorite, and I just, I don't wanna miss out on anything. So I will let you guys know <laughs> my year-end content when it gets posted, obviously but I hope you guys are doing great and are enjoying the holiday season or enjoying whatever it is that's going on and staying warm if you're in a cold place like I am and I will see you guys in another video really soon bye everybody